Good morning. It is my pleasure and honor to be here today, and I would like to thank and appreciate the uh, kind invitation and the hospitality of Professor Gunaimat, who gave me the chance to chair uh, in this valuable Congress of the Arab Society of Nephrology, uh, two presentations in two hours. So this reflects trust and respect. Thank you very much, Professor Gunaimat, for this opportunity. I'm going to speak about Anka related renal disorders, Anka vasculitis and glomerulonephritis, and I'm going to highlight this topic under the following uh, sectors. I'm going to start with the introduction, then a few words about Anka and the epidemiology of vasculitis, pathogenesis, pathology, management, predictors for the outcome, special situations, and the issue of renal transplantation. Uh, in the background of anca associated vasculitis. Let us start with the uh, definitions. So this is a very nice review about anca glomerulonephritis and vasculitis. So anca associated vasculitis, it is a symbol of a small vessel vasculitis. And according to the International Chapel Hill Consensus Conference on the Nomenclature of Vasculitis, we have these types. So we have ANCA associated vasculitis, we have microscopic polyangitis, granulomatosis with polyangitis, which was known as Wagner granulomatosis, isonophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, Church Strauss. So this is the, the names, and this, these are the definitions for each one of them. And according to the Kidigo uh, Controversies Conference uh, that was released uh, on the issue of February the, of Kidney International this year, uh, Bussi immune glomerulonephritis is one type of the pathological types, pathogenic types of glomerulonephritis. And it is either ANCA associated vasculitis or ANCA negative Bussi immune glomerulonephritis. So the uh, we so we have different types of small vessel vasculitis, and for each type of vasculitis, there is a predilection predilection for certain organs. For example, microscopic angitis affects kidney uh, more common, while the granulomatous polyangitis affects the lung and upper respiratory tract um, and the kidney as well. So you can. Uh, look at different organs, different types of vasculitis, and to see the involvement and frequency of involvement percentage for each one of them. What about ANCA? We have uh, two types principally. So we, this is indirect immune fluorescence, shows the cytoplasmic uh, type, and this is a prenuclear type. So these are the two types of uh, ANCA by indirect immune fluorescence. But I think nowadays there are tendency to use beside immune fluorescence ELISA to detect specificity for protein 3 or uh, myeloproxidase. So we have protein 3 ANCA that was known as uh, C ANCA and myeloproxidase MBBO usually B ANCA. And these are the different types of vasculitis, small vessel vasculitis. So for example, Granulomatosis with polyangitis here, 70% protein 3 ANCA, 25% myeloproxidase, and 5% negative uh, for ANCA. Microscopic angitis, 40% protein 3, 50% MBPO, and 10% negative ANCA. Isinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, Scher Strauss, here, 55% negative ANCA. Uh, while 40% positive MBBO and 5% protein A3. Regarding renal limited Bussi immune crescent glomerulonephritis, 20% protein A3, 70% MBBO, and 10% negative ANCA. The types of ANCA is different according to the gender, the age, and estimated GFR, and even the, uh, the site. Uh, and the cities. And this is the frequency of protein 3 and MBBO and MBBO specificity by variety of clinical phenotypes. 
for example if we look here this is the MBBO anka a solid line if we are if we have anka glomerulonephritis the predominant is MBBO anka and if we are speaking about lung with cavities it is a percentage of MBBO anka but the leading and the predominant is protein 3 anka this is the epidemiology of data from China I like this data registry because this is in patient database covering 54% tertiary hospitals in China in five years from 2010 to 2015. How many patients? 43.7 million in patients. And for uh, the ANCA, associated vasculitis was diagnosed in more than 10,000, approximately 11,000 ANCA associated vasculitis. In this big data registry, we know that ANCA is more common in winter, and here the age, the younger the age, the lower the frequency of the percentage of ANCA associated vasculitis, and so there is a predilection toward uh, old age, so above 60, or uh, the ANCA is uh, predominant. Is there a difference between MBO and protein 3? Yes, there is a difference in geographic distribution. You can find MBBO in southern Europe, southern, southern United States, and Asia, while protein 3 in northern Europe, northern uh, America, and Australia. HLA genetic association with DQ for MBBO ANCA and DP for protein 3 ANCA. Uh, system affection, renal, more renal affection in MBBO and the more upper respiratory tract disease in protein 3 less granulomatous inflammation in MBBO, more granulomatous inflammation with protein 3 Biopsy shows more sclerosis in MBBO and more necrosis in protein 3 Relapse is more common with protein 3 ANCA. So these, these are the differences between MBBO and the protein 3 ANCA. Regarding pathogenesis, we have different steps. So it is autoimmunity because we have antibodies that target neutrophilic uh, engines. So we have uh, start, uh, started with unprimed neutrophil, then neutrophil priming, activation, subsequent inflammation and necrosis, and the last and the ends with chronic inflammation and scarring. Just to highlight the issue of neutrophil, extracellular uh, traps here, this is the cytokine, when it binds to the neutrophil, the neutrophil becomes active in the presence of ANCA, and here you can find the, this, uh, this is the trap. So a trap is, is a part of DNA decorated with uh, protein 3 and uh, MBBO ANCA uh, engines, and this will stimulate dendritic cell, and this uh, will be subsequently uh, lead to activation of plasma cell and more ANCA. So ANCA antibodies, primed neutrophil and then neutrophil traps of the DNA that stimulate immunity and vice uh, uh, circle occurs uh, by excessive net uh, formation. From this study we know that IVIG may be helpful to uh, treat this uh, neutrophil extracellular traps. Organ pathology, this is the classic pathology showing this is mass on trichrome showing if you necrosis of the vessel and necrotizing glomerulonephritis with crescents. And this is from our center, Eurogen Nephritis Center, Mansoura University. This is a crescent necrotizing crescent glomerulonephritis. And here the vessel shows clearly the presence of fibrin necrosis. Again, fibrin necrosis in the vessel. Whenever we speak to the pathologist, we would like to have a standardized pathology report. According to this article, standardized classification and reporting of glomerulonephritis, and here we have ANCA as a special type of ANCA associated glomerulonephritis. So, I would like to know the details, including uh, one of the important items, which is chronicity. Are the pathology uh, specimens that we have uh, associated with mild chronicity, moderate, or severe chronicity? Because sometimes we decide not to give. Uh, aggressive immune suppression, and we may consider treatment fertile if it is isolated kidney with advanced uh, fibrosis. So we need the biopsy to be reported like this. It is kidney, needle biopsy, 
Anka associated glomerulonephritis, the pattern of injury, necrotizing and necrocentic, class focal, additional finding, extensive acute necrosis, chronicity mild. So this is one case reported in a professional way showing the degrees and association. What about management? According to this meeting uh, uh, report uh, here, if we have new diagnosis or relapse of anca associated vasculitis, so for new diagnosis, we should have biopsy to investigate the extent of kidney involvement, and then the treatment is either cyclophosphamide with corticosteroid or rituximab with corticosteroid. But if we have a rapidly progressive anca associated vasculitis, we may think of uh, the, uh, and especially if the creatine is above 4 mg per deciliter, crescent goophritis, or there is pulmonary hemorrhage. So if creatine is very high, and in the presence of crescent goophritis, we may think of cyclophosphamide with corticosteroid or combination of cyclophosphamide plus rituximab with corticosteroids plus or minus plasma exchange. So this is the, the combination of cyclophosphamide and rituximab is addi addition to the standards of care of treatment in this situation. So plasma exchange is debatable, may be considered in this issue, but if there is pulmonary hemorrhage, plasma exchange is mandatory. So uh, after giving this induction treatment, if the patient has remission, if remission occurs, we move to the maintenance immune suppressive therapy. So if we have remission, yes, we continue as a maintenance treatment by giving azathioprine for at least 18 months and then taper after 24 to 48 months. Or using rituximab on demand, and I'm going to highlight the doses of rituximab as maintenance treatment just in a minute, or rituximab on a fixed uh, 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 strategy for at least 18 months. So this is the treatment uh, modalities for the maintenance therapy. If there is no remission, this means that we are dealing with refractory disease, no improvement, and there is a chronic persistent disease uh, all, uh, after more than 12 weeks. So this is the refractory disease, which in therapy is switching to rituximab, a previously treated with cyclophosphamide, especially in Burtonese 3 anca patient or vice versa, or a cyclophosphamide, a previous IV cyclophosphamide failure and rituximab unavailable, or even using IVIG in a dose of 0.4 gram per kg for five days, especially a persistent low disease activity. And this is the rituximab. So this is examples of various rituximab-based regimens for induction and remission in anca-associated vasculitis that have been used in literature. So for induction, for weekly IV doses of 375 milligram per square meter, or uh, uh, two bi-weekly doses of 750 milligram, maximum uh, 1,000 milligram, and uh, or four weekly IV doses of 375 milligram per square meter and one monthly infusion, one and two months apart. Regarding the maintenance, 750 milligram per square meter, maximum one gram every six months, or 750 milligram per square meter, maximum uh, one gram every four months, uh, and uh, or seven, seven, 750 milligram per square meter, maximum one gram every six months for 24 months. So you can go to the regimen as you see in this table. So this is the induction and the maintenance strategies of using rituximab. Regarding the combination of rituximab and cyclophosphamide, is there in a study in literature? Yes, this is one of the studies uh, addressing the issue of long-term follow-up of combined rituximab and cyclophosphamide regimen in renal antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibody associated vasculitis. So this is the agent and the dose. So in day zero, rituximab is given in one gram, cyclophosphamide 10 milligram per kg, maximum 750 milligram. Then in week two, rituximab one gram, and cyclophosphamide 10 milligram per kg, maximum 750. And then uh, during week four, six, eight, and 10, 
cyclophosphamide intravenous 500 milligram uh, four times, and then corticosteroid tab taper. So you can follow this regimen, including even prophylaxis against the infection ATC. So this is the protocol of combined rituximab and cyclophosphamide. If we compare the results of combination of cyclophosphamide uh, rituximab versus the standard protocol of cyclophosphamide, you can get the message here. Relapse is less, here 21% and here 30%. Uh, um, the end stage kidney disease is less, and even death is less in comparison to standard protocol. So it seemed that combined rituximab and cyclophosphamide a strategy is superior to the standard protocol. Regarding indiv individually tailored or fixed regimen of rituximab, fixed regimen as I just mentioned in the, the, in the, in the, in the table, or individually tailored according to the level of the uh, CD19. And this, uh, uh, this is the commentary on this uh, study. Although there is no grid, no significant difference between the two protocols, tailored or fixed uh, regimens, uh, and the question, uh, as shown in this editorial comment uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, in antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibody ankle associated vasculitis in remission, do individually tailored versus fixed uh, schedule rituximab regimens differ for maintaining re remission? And the answer, as you see in this table, even if there is no major difference here, the relapse is more common in the tailored in comparison to the fixed uh, protocol. So any relapse, 16% here, 9% here, major relapse, 7.4% and 3.7%. A very interesting study using microfinite mofetel for induction of remission for ankle associated vasculitis. So this is the open label randomized control trial. We have two arms, mycophenolate versus standard cyclophosphamide, 70 patients in each uh, arm. Uh, so the, this study showed clearly that the use of MMF was non inferior to cyclophosphamide for induction of remission. However, the time for relapse is shorter with mycophenolate mofetel. And the message from this study is this study might change, might affect, impact our clinical practice uh, or future developments, MMF induction therapy in patients at low risk of relapse, such as those with myelobrixidase anchor, may be a suitable alternative to cyclophosphamide. And this gives uh, the room for using mycophenolate mofetel for patients who are afraid of the toxicities, and especially if we are speaking about MBO anchor associated vasculitis. So this is, uh, this is why the landscape is increasing with the use of immune suppression. So we have rituximab, rituximab or cyclophosphamide in severe form even. We can use in non-severe anchor associated vasculitis methotrexate, provided that GFR is above 30 uh, uh, milli per minute. And for MBO anchor, MMF also can be used, rituximab is, can be used, but in severe form, uh, cyclophosphamide or rituximab uh, or MMF, if we are speaking about MBB or ANCA. For ANCA negative, this is the strategy. So the strategies of immune suppression are increasing. And uh, an interesting question. Although for every case of active ANCA associated vasculitis, we start with uh, missile prednisolone pulses. But the question, is it essential to start with IV missile prednisolone pulses? This is a study, a retrospective cohort, discussing the, this issue. The difference between starting missile prednisolone pulses versus oral form of uh, prednisolone. Uh, and the results showed no difference in efficacy. Here, the survival and the leukopenia free patients. And here, infection is more common with missile prednisolone because this is percentage of infection free. So infection is more common with missile prednisolone pulses. And the uh, shorter time for diabetes is associated with missile prednisolone pulses. Although this is the result of this study, but we use uh, the uh, IV missile prednisolone in starting the treatment of ANCA associated vasculitis. It seems that the future will witness the uh, advances 
in treating ankle associative vasculitis by handling epigenetics, maybe in the future, and uh, more rational the use of pithel therapeutics, either targeting beta cell depletion, like the use of NCD20 antibodies, or targeting beta cell cytokines like anti baf antibodies, or even the co stimulations by abatacept and other molecules uh, like anti CD5280 C. Regarding bilimumab, it is a human monoclonal antibody that targets the stimulation of B cell, uh, and this is a randomized control study assessing the efficacy and safety of bilimumab and other to brain for maintenance of remission in anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody associated vasculitis. So they will start with in, in, inducing remission by the classic protocol, and after achieving the uh, remission, then we think of uh, maintenance therapy. So maintenance therapy, either using bilimumab, 10 mg per kg, uh, plus other therapy, targeting 2 mg per kg per day, plus low-dose glucocorticoids, or using uh, other therapy, like this protocol and the low gluc dose glucocorticoids and uh, using placebo instead of bilimumab. So bilimumab versus placebo in maintenance therapy. No significant difference, adds no significant difference to the placebo. Except here, if you look here, just here, in, in the patients who are induced with rituximab, the relapse was, uh, not, uh, was less uh, uh, evidence in bilimumab that um, may be assessed in other studies, but generally uh, bilimumab adds uh, little to the treatment, the maintenance therapy. We can use even new therapies like beta cell, T cell, cytokines treatment like tocilizumab uh, against anti interleukin 6, anti interleukin 5, complement like avacoban and others. What about elderly? Aging in primary systemic vasculitis, implication for diagnosis and management. Elderly patients with vasculitis, particularly uh, uh, joint cell arthritis and uh, ankle associated vasculitis, are at risk of disease and the treatment related complications. In particular, cyclophosphamide treatment should be reduced according to age and renal function in ankle associated vasculitis patients while glucocorticoid treatment should be reduced to the lower effective dose in all uh, these patients. And uh, um, the wisdom is to follow up meticulously these elderly patients when we treat them with immune suppressive drugs. What are the predictors for the outcome? This is an interesting study. Showed the FEC gamma receptor 1, CD64 in the serum, utility of neutrophil C CD64. Uh, here, this is, this is a fantastic because here we address ankle associated vasculitis and the systemic lupus erythematosus. Here, in infection, the level of CD64 is very high. And so this discriminates between infection and flare. So it is very high in infection. And as you see here, this is the level of ankle associated vasculitis in active disease is 4.25, but here's 76. This means if we find, this means if we find a very high level of S gamma receptor 1 or serum CD64, we are dealing with infection. And this is the area under curve for uh, this CD64 in comparison to other like brocalcitonin and reactive protein. So sensitivity is 95%, specificity 80%, positive predictive value 74%, and negative predictive value 96%. Another issue, is there a difference in, a, in, in gender in between males and females? This study included 358 cases. Here, uh, the, this is the different types, focal, mixed, crescentic, sclerotic, uh, for males and females, always the outcome is more worse in males in comparison to females. Urine analysis may be valuable, as shown in this study, persistent hematuria rather than proteinuria was associated with increased risk of relapse. Even more simple neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, a diagnosis can estimate vasculitis activity and poor prognosis in patients 
with ANCA associated vasculitis. The higher the ratio, if it is higher than 5.9, this is the, you can see here, the relapse if free survival is less. This means the relapse is more common with high level of neutrophil uh, to lymphocyte ratio and the patient survival also affected, but it's not significant. So again, the high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, the higher the risk of relapse. Low complement 3-3, uh, it is interesting in this study, patient with normal versus patient with low C3, uh, low C3, as you see here, it associated with uh, less uh, survival, renal survival. So kidney are affected badly if C3 is low, as you see in this uh, slide, and the patient survival is not significantly affected although the trend is toward the lower patient survival as well. The presence of the type of ANCA, MBBO or Brutinate 3, Brutinate 3 is associated with higher risk of relapse in comparison to MBBO. And this, I think this, is, this table shows the uh, treatment resistance, relapse, end stage kidney disease and death according to the classification of vasculitis and the classification on the basis of ANCA specificity. In the biopsy, the lower the percentage of the glomeruli, if, the, if it is less than uh, 10, the patient renal survival is drastically affected. If tuba atrophy and interstitial fibrosis is high, renal survival is affected badly. The same for GFR, if we are speaking about GFR less than 15 milli per minute, here the renal survival is drastically affected. And this, this is focal, uh, uh, mixed and sclerotic, the so focal lesions uh, is, uh, has superior outcome in comparison to the other types of uh, the pathology. And if we succeed to maintain protein 3 ANCA negative, this is associated with better outcome and the less relapse. And this is the difference between focal, crescentic, mixed, and sclerotic pathology, five-year renal survival. In different studies, focal uh, uh, is associated with better uh, outcome in comparison to the other types. The Milan experience for ANCA-associated vasculitis showed that the outcome at last observation, normal renal function at 30, 38%, chronic renal insufficiency 10%, dialysis 35% and death 15%. And this is the uh, effect of ANCA associated vasculitis in 10 years on the patient and pure kidney survival. So this is kidney survival is uh, affected. And here this is the patient survival a little bit affected. Regarding the special situation, if we have ANCA associated vasculitis, with or without ANCA associated glomerulonephritis, the presence of ANCA associated glomerulonephritis was associated with uh, the worse outcome. So the presence of ANCA associated glomerulonephritis uh, means bad news. As you see here clearly, five year survival, 10 year survival mortality is higher if ANCA associated glomerulonephritis is present. ANCA associated vasculitis may be. Uh, encountered with giant cell arthritis in, in one patient. This is temporal artery biopsy showing the giant cell arthritis and this necrotizing glomerulonephritis in one patient. And so we should evaluate the patient meticulously. Even ANCA associated vasculitis have uh, had uh, major similarities with IgG4, so we should search for the manifestations of IgG4 related diseases like the, as you see here, orbit, mediastinum nose, um, the lacrimal gland affection, ETC. So uh, this is why we should think of monitoring the patient well by looking at the ANCA and the IgG4 and selecting the best treatment for the patients with IgG4 related disease. Pulmonary renal syndrome, this is a case, a relapse of the case of pulmonary renal syndrome after a sequential rise in MBO ANCA and the anti GBM antibodies, so double serology, as you see here. But at the end of the day, uh, dialysis was the, the rule and the kidney doesn't recover. Let us discuss this case. So, this is a patient who has polyarthritis, hypertension, purpura crash. So, this is a systemic manifestation, uh, creatinine 6.7, so renal failure with uh, proteinuria, hematuria and high level of anti-proteinase 3 ANCA. 
and this is a biopsy shown crescent growth right so some coronicity as you see this is sclerosed which of the following treatment strategies is appropriate in this case induction treatment with plasma exchange therapy and high dose corticosteroid induction treatment with rituximab and high dose corticosteroids Induction treatment with mycophenolate mofetil and high dose corticosteroids prepare for dialysis. No immune suppression recommended. The best answer is induction treatment with rituximab and high dose corticosteroids. Why? Because for this patient, plasma exchange alone with corticosteroids is not the standard of care. Induction treatment with mycophenolate in the presence of proteinitri anca and severe renal failure is not the rule. And as the, the, the most recent study, uh, addressing the MBBO anchor rather uh, and not protein three anchor. Uh, prepare for dialysis. I think for the presence of uh, systemic disease, it's better to treat by giving induction the chance for immune suppression drug. Another case: this elderly man with fatigue, dyspnea, and kidney failure, and he received the cocktail of drug cardiovascular drugs, including hydrolazine. And the biopsy revealed necrotizing glomerulonephritis. So it's anchor associated glomerulonephritis and vasculitis due to the use of drugs. If we think of hydrolysine induced vasculitis, what serology result would you expect to find in this patient? The answer is the MBPO anchor because it is the most common with the drug induced vasculitis. And here we are not speaking about lupus. This is the list with a stronger evidence base. For drug induced anca associated vasculitis, hydrolysine, minocycline, propyl thiouracil, methimazole, carbamazole, levimazole. And levimazole um, is interesting because cocaine is adulterated with levimazole. So, and weaker evidence base for these uh, drugs, penicillamine, alabrinol, ATC. If we stop the drug and still there is uh, active uh, disease, what is the next step? If any further therapy would you recommend for this patient, uh, either no additional therapy, microphetamophetel, cyclophosphamide intravenous or oral, rituximab at the cell brain. I think the best answer is cyclophosphamide, either intravenous or oral, because even rituximab is not tested well in the drug-induced vasculitis. Another uh, case showing that uh, systemic B anchor vasculitis with fatal outcome and mortality arising in the setting of methimazole use. So we should be aware as uh, the physicians and endocrinologists for the side effect of this drug. Cocaine, who can be associated with anchor associated vasculitis, uh, um, maybe due to levimazole added to cocaine. So, and this is the clinical significance of uh, positive ANCA. So here uh, we are speaking about ANCA without vasculitis. So you monitor the serum of the patient and you find the positive ANCA without any systemic vasculitis. So uh, we should evaluate the patient properly. Uh, if we find a low titer of ANCA with absence of any manifestations, we uh, should increase the threshold for the diagnosis and not to be indulged in, in a severe immune suppression without necessity. So if you look here to the level, in no evidence of vasculitis, you'll find the level of uh, ELISA protein 3 is 3.2, here 6.2, and MBO is 2.6 versus the presence of vasculitis 5.4. So it's better to increase the titer for more specificity. Especially if there is no systemic manifestation, you can find the anchor associated vasculitis with other autoimmune diseases and overlap, reflecting unrecognized example of poly autoimmunity. Even in lupus nephritis, if there is positive anchor plus lupus, uh, uh, lupus nephritis, the presence of anchor in the serum of the patient with lupus nephritis predict coronicity. It's associated with more coronicity index in the pathology. With thymoma, uh, up to this moment, there are eight cases, and this is the eighth case of microscopic blood angiitis associated with thymic tumor. Uh, why? Because uh, thymoma disrupted the tolerance and it may be associated with anca associated vasculitis. So, this is a case with, of thymoma associated with microscopic blood angiitis with positivity for three anchors. 
MB1 anka protein 3 anka and azuru sidin anka azuru sidin anka may be just by standard and doesn't reflect severity and this is the uh, the pathology and the radiology of the case uh, case showing the thymoma thymic tumor and the anka crescent gonophritis the patient was treated because of vasculitis by rituximab and steroid and uh, anka levels uh, are reduced but the patient uh, continued in dialysis even in IgA nephropathy with systemic disease systemic manifestation systemic symptoms the presence of systemic symptoms plus IgA predict poor renal survival FMF may be associated with a high ANCA in the blood with ANCA positivity so in this scenarios it's better to uh, to diagnose the case as FMF, and if we diagnose FMF, the treatment is colchicine. This is an example. This table summarizes different cases of overlap syndrome between anca associated vasculitis and other autoimmune diseases. Regarding renal transplantation, I take this slide from Professor Gunaimat, and this is from the Kidigo 2012. They recommend delaying transplantation until patient are, patients are in complete extraordinary remission. And they recommend not delaying transplantation for patients who are in complete remission but are still ANCA positive. Frequency of recurrence is about 20%. Graft loss, loss caused by recurrence less than 5%. Positive ANCA titer at the time of transplant doesn't increase the risk of recurrent disease. Recurrent ANCA glomerulonephritis in transplant response to therapy similarly to recurrent disease in native kidneys. However, our practice is to postpone transplant for a period of time until we, show, we are sure that everything is fine. This is an interesting case report about de nouveau ANCA associated vasculitis after kidney transplantation and the patient treated with rituximab and the plasma exchange but eventually the graft fails. And so this is the, an interesting point. The interesting point is whenever we have allograft function, it's better to think of biopsy and to look at the etiology we may find ANCA associated vasculitis. My final message in this presentation, ANCA associated vasculitis, ANCA associated glomerulonephritis is a typical model of autoimmunity and inflammation. So to change the, the picture of ANCA associated vasculitis, think of autoimmunity, breathe autoimmunity and learn autoimmunity. And the, I, I like this uh, editorial comment. Sometimes the only way is to discuss the case with our colleagues, our seniors, and this is one of the merit of the uh, Nephrology Unit at Theology and Nephrology Center. Every morning we meet together to discuss the cases in a chair decision making and discuss with the patients and with other specialists, uh, uh, specialty doctors to know the best, to, to reach the best treatment for our patients. This is the, the renal unit, the Nephrology Unit at Theology and Nephrology Center, and this is a professor name. And uh, the, I like to end all my presentations by this statement. Uh, the doctor is a student till his death. When he fails to be a student, he dies. A doctor is a student till he dies. Once he considers himself not a student anymore, the doctor inside him dies. So we should continue uh, for education and learning. Education and learning, uh, this will make the, the difference. And thank you very much for a uh, uh, kind invitation and attention, and I'm ready for your questions.